Welcome everyone. We are getting started now with the Hadley School Committee, December 20th um, monthly meeting. Do I have a motion to open the meeting? Meeting. All right, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. All right, terrific. Um, we are going to uh, first ask about adjustments to the agenda, Annie. Yes, so if you look at what is highlighted now on your agenda here on the live agenda in yellow, so the business manager reports will be presented in January and uh, Paul Pfeiffer is not with us this evening. So Fields and Capital, he'll have his update for us in January. And we will not require an executive session this evening. So we Correct. do not need that. Go ahead and put that in there. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Annie. Um, sure. All right. So let's start with the um, public comment. As a reminder, um, limit of three minutes. Um, uh, public can, uh, and we may or may not be able to to comment in return. Um, I don't know. I think maybe only Amy might be a member of the public here. No, I believe that's Miss Lanham. So she's here to present the field trip with Mr. Burns. And I made her a co-host. So if it isn't Miss Lanham, could you let me know that? Uh, but I believe it's Miss Lanham. All right, terrific. All right, so any um, members of the public or anyone else uh, here for open comment? Public comment. Okay, um, hearing none, let's proceed then with the regular agenda. So um, we have submitted a proposal to take some of the high school students. This would be eligible. Um, the students who would be eligible would be in the current freshman, sophomore, and junior class because the trip would take place next fall. Um, we are asking to take them to DC for a span of about five days. And um, we have delineated some of the educational opportunities. Um, the trip would basically focus on a uh, framework where we're looking at visiting many museums to broaden their understanding of the world and our nation's capital um, and doing uh, some, some additional things as well, trying to expose them to kind of multicultural foods from around the world during our time in DC uh, with a, a focus on issues of citizenship and social justice. So that's kind of what the trip is all about. It is an overnight trip. Uh, Mr. Burns and I have done similar trips in the past, just like this. Um, we have included uh, the proposed itinerary and a breakdown of the curricular connections and then also a uh, finance sheet of anticipated fundraising for you guys to peruse. Okay. Um, Jason. Yes, I can add to the, the financial side of it. Um, our, we did put in a request to the Board of Trustees for support for the trip, and we heard back from today that they have agreed to be significantly more generous than we asked for. Um, so on here, with all the fundraising we have planned, we said we were hoping to get it below 500. I think that will be a very easy thing to do at this point. Um, and that's with filling the bus at 46 students. That's you. We usually get around 40. So I, I don't foresee that being an issue. Um, yes, they decided to be much, much, much more generous than what we asked for, um, which is wonderful. Um, so we anticipate having money to help all students go, but more particularly um, any students that this would be a financial hardship, um, which was one of our goals was this trip is one that we think we can make doable for any student, um, unlike other overnight trips. That is such great news. Um, huge thanks to the um, trustees for that generous, generous donation. Uh, we so appreciate their ongoing um, uh, 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 very generous support of the students. Um, my, my one question was going to be, how does this fall in uh, alignment with uh, the, the, the mid-year elections? And it looks as though the mid-year election date is November 8th. So this falls a couple of weeks later. So hopefully DC should be settled down 
with any luck um, after that. Um, I have no other comments. Um, how about my committee members? I see some- Looks like a great trip. Yeah. I just would like to give credit if I could to uh, the school committee, as you know, in the, in the agenda, there's a link to the documents. The presentation of the trip, I have to say, is an exemplar of how any trip should be. It is so thorough with the alignment to standards and to what's being taught in school. And um, I'm grateful for the Board of Trustees. I'm also extremely grateful that Ms. Lanham and Mr. Burns made it a priority to ensure that we have a trip that is within reach of students who may come from low-income families. And I did an analysis after they pointed out to me that that was a priority of theirs. And it's actually the only trip where there has, in the past when they've done this trip, it is the only trip that we've seen um, the most diverse participation when you're talking about different um, households with different economic circumstances. So um, it doesn't go unnoticed and I really appreciate it. Can I just add, I just wanna also give a shout out to the chaperones who are gonna do this. Just <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I was gonna ask about chaperones. Uh, what, what is the policy on chaperones and are you accepting any? I think my daughter is going to be going, and I, I wouldn't mind being a chaperone if you were welcome. <laughs> we typically only take staff members. Okay, great. Sorry. No. <laughs> All right. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, moving on to, and thank you, Amy and Jason, for presenting this and spearheading it. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next item. Uh, oh, by the way, Annie, do we have to vote on this? Yes, you do. That's why they came. Sorry. Yes, you do. <laughs> Right. They're probably like, yeah, thanks for all the compliments, Annie, but really, can, can we get to the meat of the matter here? Get this approved. Do um, so I hear a motion to approve this trip? So moved. Okay, second? Seconded. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, happy trails. Thank you again. <laughs> all right, excellent. So moving on to the presentation of goals. Director of Special Education, Celia Snow. Welcome, Celia. Hey, everybody. Hello. Um, hello, hello. All right, so even though I spend most of my day on uh, Zoom meetings, this is a, a different format for me, so I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, I'll get through it. Wow. Um, in terms, <laughs> for my, I mean, I guess my overarching goal is to collaborate with the principals to ensure that all students um, get the supports and accommodations that they need efficiently to ensure a continuum of services. Um, so I don't see the uh, special ed department or the student services department as this like separate entity that only deals with students with disabilities or students with special needs. Um, so I kind of, I, what I did in order to look at what my goals would be is I looked at each of the school's uh, strategic action plans, and then looked at priorities that I feel overlap with the special ed department or student services department as well. Um, so I, as you guys have access to the document, but um, at the elementary school, and some of these overlap because uh, the elementary school and the high school, well, middle and high school also had overlapping uh, identified priorities as well. But um, at the elementary school, uh, develop and continuously re revise the curriculum uh, to ensure rigor, relevance, and alignment to state standards. Emphasis will be on ELA, so that's at the elementary school. Um, so currently, I've been um, meeting with the special ed teachers to review their current um, interventions and then discuss additional needs. Um, part of that also renewed a Read Live um, subscription, which is a program that can be general ed students, it can be special ed students, and um, I'm overseeing that and overlapping and allowing licenses for both general ed students and special ed students as well, um, based on needs. So really collaborating with the general ed teachers and the special ed teachers um, on that. And actually um, a lot of that happens during the uh, tiered intervention um, that happens at, uh, at the elementary school. And then also looking at a more intensive uh, level of instruction. So um, doing some training for staff in Orton-Gillingham, uh, which is something that we had had. And then our reading um, teacher became 
a classroom teacher, so we don't have that uh, as an available resource at the elementary school. Um, and I know that there's a small number of students that really need that intervention. So looking at that, um, and then another goal is revise and review the implementation of the multi-tiered system of supports that includes PBIS, um, which we'll, Michelle will speak more to. Um, and this is sort of really combined with the um, what was the child study process and now we just more recently renamed it to uh, our tiered support team. Um, and so as part of this, um, I'm providing consultation to staff on accommodations and modifications that can be provided to all students. I'll, I'll also attend grade level meetings. Um, I'm invited to all of those at the middle and high school, 504 meetings as applicable. Um, and then also going to uh, now the tiered support team meetings um, as applicable. So really doing the range and not just saying, oh, oh no, I only do the IEP meetings um, so that I can be involved in the entire process, which I think is really important. Um, and then just looking for sort of long-term is um, part of the things that we're looking at is looking at our universal screening processes. So I wanna be involved with that with the principals um, and then purchasing any additional screening um, and or providing training to staff. So part of that for this year is um, doing the Orton Gillingham and then um, meeting with Jen and April to look at what else we wanna look at. I don't know how long I have. Hopefully I'm still on the elementary school, but um, another one is just a two-way family communication. So being new, I made sure that I reached out to all families and sent out a welcome email. And then also looking at um, collaborating with the other districts that we collaborate for our CPAC and um, collaborating a little bit with the PTO. I reached out to the PTO so that they could upload some of our workshops that we'll be doing through the Federation for Children with Special Needs. And then looking at the workshops and making sure that information goes out as applicable to all families. So in the past, it's just been sent to uh, families of students with special needs. But for instance, for the bullying pre prevention workout workshop, I had that sent out um, through school variants to all families so that um, because it's applicable to all families and even though it's the CPAC. And then um, as far as at the elementary school, foster and build professional culture. Uh, so at the beginning of the year, I met with all the ESPs. I asked them what they felt was working, policies they felt were working, um, and things that they felt needed improvement. I took that information back to the leadership team. And so one example was that they wanted to be included in professional development, um, or at least offered. So that's something that we, our first uh, PD, we did offer it to them. Um, and so I think just doing that on a regular basis is, you know, including them and just getting feedback from the ESPs um, because they're a really important part of the school culture as well. Um, and so I want to continue that practice. Moving on to Hopkins, um, a big piece that we are working on is curriculum mapping, as you guys are likely aware. Uh, so I did on the PD day meet with the special ed teachers. Um, our focus on that day was coming up with a curriculum and sort of an overview of the purpose of the academic support period. Uh, so I worked with them to get that um, written up and it's still in process. And then also I've been meeting with um, our new life skills teacher and this kind of ties into another, um, the next one, the A5 of the new inclusive programming and the life skills, but meeting with her on a regular basis to really work on um, developing the curriculum that's gonna be for the life skills program. And you know what the, by the end of this plan, I wanna have an overview of the program that could be written up somewhere, you know, this is what the life skills program is. These are students that benefit. This is the purpose um, criteria for entry. It's really focusing on that. And then also, um, and again, this is tying, tying into the A5, but looking at the inclusive classrooms. So we switched the model to a more co-teaching model this year. Um, and so as the co-teachers are working together to come up with um, modified lessons, working on saving those lessons alongside the other lesson plans so that it's not reinventing the wheel, but we have a continuum of lessons of like, this is the general ed lesson and this is a modified lesson plan. Um, so really focusing on that. And then, um, so then this is sort of the repetitive, the B1, which is overlaps with the elementary, but um, the multi-tiered system of supports and likewise at the middle and high school at Hopkins, um, attending grade level meetings and talking to teachers about accommodations that they can provide in all classrooms, um, which you know comes up a lot. And it's come up 
with teachers if they have a student that they have a concern about, I'm happy to meet with them. And, you know, it doesn't have to be in an IEP to provide an accommodation. You can provide an accommodation to any student. And then um, this one, I haven't done anything yet because it hasn't happened yet, but I did see this and it jumped out at me about the um, community read that April had put in the document. And um, I would really like to collaborate with um, Hopkins leadership to include perspectives and families of students with disabilities or students with disabilities, depending on their age level, as part of the community read. Um, so that was just something that uh, jumped out as me that I, that I could participate in that as well. Um, again, also fostering and building a professional and open, open and reflective culture by meeting with ESPs. I also meet with the related service providers weekly. Um, we include the clinical support staff every other week, and it's just a way to touch base and just make sure that we keep communication open. Um, and I have staff evaluation on there, but um, you know, I think that kind of fell off the other plans as well. But uh, it's definitely important. We participated in the PD and um, trying to come up with a more systematic way of doing evaluation for the ESPs is also really an important thing that we're working on right now. Great. Thank you, Celia. This is some um, very comprehensive plan. And I think this is our your first presentation to us and you did uh, great. Welcome again to the group. And that was not too nerve wracking, um, I would say, right? Oh, not too bad. <laughs> not, not too bad. Um, I, I think this is a, a really um, great plan, as I mentioned, comprehensive. And I, uh, I do have not very many questions. Uh, one question, though, about PBIS. I know at the elementary school, we've implemented PBIS for, uh, you know, many years and at, at, and now newly at the high school, middle school, high school level. So um, what does that look like in terms of helping educators understand what it is and how to use it as something in their wheelhouse? Right. And I think um, a big part of that will be um, professional development. And it's a kind of identifying, um, you know, what works at the elementary school doesn't necessarily work at the middle and high school. And so you have to find programs that kind of address the K through 12 continuum, but then have advanced uh, curriculum-ish for middle and high school students. And so the CASEL um, website can identify programs that do that. And even if it's not the same program, it, they can recommend programs that link to elementary programs so that there's common language, but you're still addressing the needs that uh, we know that teenagers have that are quite challenging. I have a 16 year old, so, um, you know, I know that their needs are, are definitely different. So I think part of that is identifying what makes sense to teachers at the middle and the high school, because otherwise they're not going to, they're not going to want to do it because they're going to say that's not relevant to the kids that I work with. Precisely. I, I don't even know what it looks like when it's done well at the middle or high school level. Right. So over time, it would be helpful if you could help us understand what that looks like. I, I'm sure you're working on it for the educators, first and foremost, but thank you for helping us understand as well what that looks like. Celia, I had a quick question. This is Heather. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the Hopkins uh, part of the plan under A5 with life skills, high school program, I was curious if you could talk about whether or not um, content such as di digital citizenship would be covered in that kind of life skills, thinking about life skills in many ways are, there are a lot of dependencies on um, technology and use of digital devices. And we've talked a bit about digital citizenship in this forum and, you know, making smart choices about um, social media and use like that. And I was just curious whether that is part of that program or, or not and how it's envisioned. Yeah, actually, um, we're collaborating. So um, I got the pre-ETS uh, program through Easter Seals um, up and running, and they've already started working with the students. And they come once a month and they train them on a variety of things. And I believe, and I'd have to check, but I believe part of that uh, training does involve um, the effective use of social media and how to be safe and how to safely use it. Um, and so this program, so our students that are there now are currently in ninth grade um, and the, pre, the 
it's pre-employment -empl training services, but they cover a huge variety of topics. They'll be doing it once a month throughout their school career. And as we bring in um, hopefully some middle school students and start that program, then um, we'd be collaborating with them as well. And then I believe uh, the AFLS, that's the, um, it's kind of like the assessment uh, and the, the assessment of functional living skills, I believe it's what it is. Um, and that actually is helping uh, guide Charlotte, Ms. Monier's curriculum um, because it really targets like each of the areas of functional living skills and it breaks it down. And then within those, there's like elements um, within each of those. And part of that within that curriculum is um, the use of technology. So it's, it's really embedded in that, that program, even though it's not a curriculum, it really is guiding us right now until if we want to purchase a curriculum, um, that's what we've been using to guide the program. Thank you, that's great to hear, appreciate it. Any other questions for Celia? No questions, but um, just, I agree with you, Mayor. It was a great presentation and um, I'm excited to see the work that you're gonna be doing in the high school. I'm really um, excited to see that that's gonna be taking off. And, um, you know, I've heard nothing but positive things thus far um, about you and your work. So thank you. Um, so yeah, so just I'm excited to ongoing meetings, hearing from you and finding out more updates on how things are working. Great, thank you so much. I think, oh, sorry, you can go ahead. I particularly appreciate, uh, Celia, how much time you put into reviewing the strategic action plans from the schools and just underscoring the fact that special education is not something that is on its own outside of what happens day to day in the schools. So I so appreciate how you have contributed so much to our team and how important it is for you to make sure that special education and general education are just fully integrated. The staff, the students, I appreciate that very much. So thank you. Thank for you that. for saying that, Annie, because it, it just reminded me that I was, yeah. as I was reading over these plans in advance, it occurred to me that this is very aligned with what we're looking for across the board. And it was very helpful to see the, um, the strategies and implementation plan mapping to what we want overall in a way that we haven't yet in the past for special education efforts. So um, that was a breath of fresh air. I really appreciate that. Well done. And at the risk of embarrassing Celia, I'm going to say this, excellent work and the only time in my career, now I've been in, in administration for a long time, that I got a phone call from an educational advocate complimenting us on our hire. So Tara's laughing, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> so. I, I saved it. I saved the message on my phone and made sure I played it for Celia, but that has never happened. So well done. Positive educational advocate responses from you as well, that you're absolutely lovely. Thank you. Well, I can uh, maintain that. <laughs> of course. Excellent. Thank you so much, Celia, for um for your presentation. We look forward to staying in touch with um, Special Education Matters and hearing your work updates again. Thanks. Thank you. And um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to, I can stay through Michelle's presentation because it, like I said, it all ties in together. So I want to hear her presentation. Of course. All right. Onward then to item C, presentation of goals 2021-2022 for Special Education MTTS coach Michelle Wotowitz. Michelle. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I enjoyed speaking with you all back in September, um, one of your retreat nights there. So I'm looking forward to elaborating a bit more uh, tonight and talking about some of the work we've done regarding social emotional learning, as well as um, multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, I'll elaborate a bit on each column if you're in the doc here, starting with instructional leadership. Um, one of the big things I've been tasked with this week, uh, this year, is conducting monthly 75-minute professional development sessions for our elementary school faculty, uh, focusing on responsive classroom uh, techniques and strategies. Um, in September, I gave staff an overview of what that might look like and worked with people at responsive classroom to 
uh, increase my level of training a little bit and also mold it to our needs in the district. And we're using the teacher survey on data as well as our district DEIB goals to determine what content um, areas we're going to focus on this year and at what times of the year we'll, we'll focus on those. Um, you have a link there. Um, I'll just highlight a couple. We started the year with building effective listening skills. Uh, today's session was on uh, proactive behavior, uh, proactive discipline management. Um, tools that teachers can use upon their return in January. Uh, we'll touch on creating equity and seeing that students belong in the coming um, coming months too. Uh, each of these sessions provide faculty with an opportunity to reflect on their practice, um, as well as plan for specific implementation of these strategies in their learning spaces. Um, and throughout the Throughout my trainings over the year with Responsive Classroom, I've also um, been able to build a pretty sizable resource library. Um, so I, I, those are offered to teachers as well, as well as consult times with me or working with them um, in their learning spaces to implement any of these. Um, I'm also making efforts in the planning of these sessions um, that they're, that faculty is really immersed in in the learning and in the content and the strategies. Um, and hopefully that's um, building some nice uh, teamwork and collaboration among staffs and um, touching on um, staff professionalism and skill building as well. Uh, I also did a training, uh, Celia touched on it with ESPs um, earlier in October. Uh, that afternoon session, we had a full afternoon together. We focused on positive behavior supports as well as using um, effective teacher language with our educational support professionals. We're gonna use um, data from our January PBIS meeting with Hopkins to help us determine if and what any March or April district uh, PD sessions that I might facilitate, what those might look like. Uh, and the final way I'm supporting staff this year is through their educa educator evaluations. Uh, as you know, we've prioritized social emotional learning this year, and some staff have chosen to um, use that as their student goal or their professional learning goal. So I've worked with some, um, and I, I believe I have an example um, in the doc too of what you might see how I helped teachers create goals and then follow up with them throughout the year on implementing strategies and collecting data um, in order to meet those goals. Um, as moving on to management and operations, um, I am overseeing the school-wide incentive program for PBIS at the elementary school. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were up, able to update school signage. We have a few new staff members. So I worked with them on getting their classroom programs running. Um, uh, we updated some other learning spaces and what that might look like in the building. Um, and we were very excited to get back to our school-wide incentive that program that we weren't able to do last year due to COVID. Um, some ad of the administration, as well as the school psychologists and I, I uh, have worked with consultants from UMass um, for supporting PBIS in um, at both levels and um, district practices. And as you mentioned, Mara, earlier, um, trying to create more like linear continuity with those with those programs. I actually had a really nice compliment. The UMass folks came last week. I met with them at the elementary school and they did a quick walkthrough um, and they said, you have everything we want in, in a building when, when we step foot. It's welcoming, it's calm environment, students are on task learning. When we stopped and approached them or said hello, they were kind and friendly back. Um, so it was really, really encouraging. Um, and to your your point, we've been we've given them the foundation they need at the elementary school. Um, and we're gonna look to to build that over at over at Hopkins in the coming months. Um, also at the elementary school, we transferred all of our discipline data into school brain. So that took a little, little learning on my part and then, um, teaching it out, teaching it out to staff. Um, and with that, I worked with, um, some UMass folks and then also, um, one of our school psychologists and her, uh, student intern this year to develop a data collection system for our check-in checkout, which is a tier two program, um, within our PBIS program. Um, 
Uh, next month, um, UMass will give on January 10th um, an overview of positive behavior supports to faculty and staff at Hopkins. Soon thereafter, I will work with them on the rolling out of that program and what it will look like at our middle and high school levels. I've done a little work, a little bit more with the middle school than the high school levels. Um, some teachers have been trying things uh, in the last several several weeks, some incentives within the class. But um, once we get that January meeting under our belt, we'll have a clearer picture of um, exactly what that looks like at the middle school level. And right now, the um, Hopkins folks, they've done great. They're open to something that looks the same at the middle and high school level or different, but um, we're going to let the experts at UMass <laughs> give everybody that same overview and we'll be collecting data and using that uh, faculty input to determine what best suits our, our needs um, right now over at Hopkins. Um, with regard to family and community engagement, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we weren't able to do the whole school incentives last year at the elementary school. I'm Happy to report, um, and some of you know this, we've resumed those practices this year. Um, it's been a real joy to walk into the building and see the kids excited to put their wings in the cart and see these, I should have brought one to show, <laughs> clear containers and the, the wings building up um, as the month goes on. So when we resumed that practice, I did send an email out to all families, um, sort of reintroducing and for the younger ones to introducing what that um, looks like uh, and sounds like at the elementary school. Uh, the faculty's been great about um, rewarding students with wings and giving them opportunities to turn in um, their wings for monthly incentives. Um, and students have done a great job of earning those as well. Um, each month in Ms. Dowd's um, newsletter, excuse me, uh, we share out um, who those winners are and, and announce what the incentives are that students can work for for the following month. And we do the same in um, Annie's superintendent's weekly, weekly email. Um, we're looking a little bit more and we've already got some better community involvement than we've had community engagement in the past, I should say. Um, places like Pins and uh, Cinemark, they're back to donating uh, gift cards or movie passes, which is great. Um, one thing we implemented this year that people jumped on right away, we've had a few parent donation parents um donate items to the program which has been wonderful um we've also even had a couple parents volunteer um time um it's right around uh halloween a big hit was face painting and the creation of um some uh, food art a snack a special snack healthy snack um where they made um they made little uh like you know, like a balloon artist would make a dog or something at a carnival or a circus. They did that lit with toothpicks and grapes and the students had had um, had a blast. So maintaining um, and continuing our our community um, engagement with places like Pins and Cinemark and also um, the folks at through the Hadley Police and Fire have been great partners with us in this program as well. So um, the last thing I want to say about our incentive program, both in the classroom and the school, um, we're really focusing on building relationships. I know I, I've mentioned a couple of gift certificates and things like that, but really um, the vast majority of the incentives are some sort of experiences that children can partake in and build relationships with the adult around them. Things like making slime with a school psychologist, um, uh exercising board games with some teachers um those are always big hits and go over really well with the students and the last the professional um culture um coming into this role i what one of the things i was tasked with is looking at as celia mentioned our child study process um things fell together pretty pretty smoothly but more a little bit more quickly i think than any of us anticipated um a few years and well i should say let me back up we've long had a child study process in place at the elementary school but last year 
um, given the challenges of, of COVID, we weren't able to implement it in the same. We weren't able to use all the components of the process in, in previous years. Meanwhile, Hopkins had a way of doing things and I was tasked with really trying to create um, a, 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 a a stronger continuity in the process and um, more linear practices across the district. And um, I was able to begin facilitating those those meetings fairly quickly. Um, we're able to use universal screening data from the beginning of the year, as well as take a look at Hopkins practices. And we've had about a dozen meetings. Um, and through throughout that time too, I've met with school psychologists as well as the administration and we continue to tweak it, but we're in very good shape with that process right now. We have updated it from child study. A more appropriate name is uh, saying that we are referring a student for to the tiered support team to see if there are any anything that we can, anything that we can do specific to the learning environment for the child or their programming that might help the student make make greater gains. What that has also done through the facilitation of those meetings um, is that it has also helped us to identify larger group needs. For example, um, I'll use kindergarten and first grade as an example here, um, but as you might imagine, last year, um, all grades saw not as many opportunities for practice in a particular skill. I'm going to use the skill of handwriting. Our kindergarten students did not have the opportunities to practice handwriting to the extent last year to the extent they did in years prior to that. Um, so using a combination of the universal screening data as well as what we were seeing in referrals, student referrals to the tiered support team, we were able to implement structure like whole class handwriting lessons, getting additional doses than they would have in previous years and having our OT um, go in and do those. We've also been able to identify um, some some gaps and um, suck some concerns around our um, math universal screening and we're working hard um, to to um, build and improve our tier two math structure. And we look forward to implementing um, a specific program for that beginning in January. Um, and lastly, under professional culture, um, when creating a professional development plan for the district, I'm surveying teachers um, and after each session I do, I'm asking them <laughs> to provide me with some feedback and I'm using that to make improvements for each of my monthly sessions. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and any future trainings or areas that I can help with them individually. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Michelle. Again, I'm I want, I'm really appreciative of the following of the same kind of um, format for us to be able to map our overall district strategy with um, the the work that you're leading. Uh, it's very helpful. Well, while Humera connects, if if you don't mind, Michelle, sure. it, I really uh, appreciated your overview of this, and it's just so. Um, you know, reaffirming and just, I think it, it's inspirational to see it on in this plan and to hear um, the activities that have happened and the priorities that are being placed throughout the year. And just, you know, it's great to hear about it. We are all, I'm sure, looking forward to continuing to hear uh, progress as you implement this throughout the year. And it's, I really appreciated to hearing about the community involvement, um, you know, beyond just gift cards and things like that, which are so wonderful, but also just the experience um, mm -hmm. and having connections with um, community members, like, like face paintings. So thank you for presenting that. Thank you. Well, you may want very to little. turn your camera off. It says your bandwidth is low. So you may want to turn your camera off and see if that helps oh, you at all. Is that better? No, more clearly? Can hear you. Okay, that's you know what? Let's let's run with that. Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, now you're great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. terrific. Sorry about that. Um, who can you know even figure out what what makes you, uh, work one moment and not the next? Uh, 
excellent presentation, Michelle. Thank you so much for, um, I, I echo what Heather uh, mentioned, really appreciate to our overall strategy. I really appreciate how you um, took us through the PIS components. I, I remain eager to see Hopkins Academy level. We're right now. We're um, we're probably second graders in your in your class, and and we're we're in your wing at some time or another. And so to see you know map social emotional aspects for them through very um, awkward years and school year pathetic as you. I miss we will um, our strategy in having an, a social emotional learning and MTTS as coach is um, is going to really sort of bear fruit for us in that regard. So thank you. And, you know, we're really, really excited about this work. So please keep that in mind as you make asks for us in the ways in which we improve the experience for students and educators at the middle and high school level. Thank you. I'm very excited too to get things underway at Hopkins and hopefully shortly after that January 10th meeting, we'll We'll have a vision and I'll be able to share that out. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're all very excited too about it. I'll just add, I wanna make sure you give yourself enough credit, Michelle. Although uh, you'll be meeting with that follow-up meeting with the, with the University of Massachusetts Amherst, you have done a tremendous amount of work already with teachers mm -hmm. and the administration at Hopkins. You've met individually with teachers who've asked you to help them problem solve because students are, it's hard. It's hard to still be coming off of the pandemic and, and to gradually return to school as it was before, uh, before 2020. And so you've done a great job and teachers have spoken very highly of, uh, they're appreciative of the time you've given them, the insights that you've provided, the resources you've provided and the concrete uh, support that you've given them. So. You've done a lot at Hopkins already, and we're very Thank you. excited about it. Thank you. I just want to add in to, I know I always share my excitement as everybody else does about this role. And just really quickly, I am st I'm still excited about this role. Um, and I am I'm appreciative that you in particular are in this role um, because it's a, it is a familiar face for the kids. Um, and I think that that helps. And I think you're not just a familiar face, you're a face that kids light up to see. Um, they all speak very fondly of you in the elementary school. And I'm sure they take, I sure they will take just as kindly you do in the high school. So I'm just, I'm happy for the role and I'm happy that we have you in particular in this role. I just think it's a really great fit. And I'm still just excited to see uh, in the new year, um, what updates you have. Thank you so much. Very kind. And yeah, I'm thrilled with how things have started off and very excited for the remainder of the year as well. Great. Great. Been all, all great. <laughs> all great. It's all been said. I just, I do want to echo one thing that Annie said. I think it's just so great that we've been able to implement, implement this program, mm -hmm. the, you know, the year coming off of, uh, of the COVID year and how important it is to be able to have this program in place for our, our ATS students and hopefully our Hopkins students soon. Um, I just think it's, it's great that we've been able to make this much progress this quickly. Well, thank you all again for your continued support. Um, it's very, very much appreciated. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. And just an FYI to the school committee, you don't need to approve either of these plans. You only approve school plans. But Celia and Michelle just wanted you all to be aware of what they were working on and how they were working with the administration. Appreciate that. And thank you for continuing to bring them back. This is very helpful for us to just keep a, our finger on the pulse of what's going on. Um, I'm going to put my video back off just to minimize the, the bandwidth disruptions. Okay, moving on uh, to uh, the next item, D, requests for flags, banners in the classroom. And these were the ones that were prior to implementation of the flag policy, as I understand it. Uh, Annie. Yes, that's correct, Humera. So we approved a policy that going forward, teachers will, although I've offered to do what I've done here for a teacher if they can't make it to school committee, 
but I certainly wanted to make it easier for folks who already had some things up prior to the school committee policy. So what you see in the sheet that is linked into your agenda, the building where the flag is located, the location, the staff member, the type of flag, the connection to the curriculum and or culturally responsive practice. And if I've cited one of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's documents, I've indicated that by putting that uh, source, what that connection is. Um, and then the connection to district policies or our vision or our values. I would recommend that the school committee approve the flags that you see presented to you in the sheet. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. In the list um, where it was um, unexpected and it seems all pretty straightforward and I would motion to, I don't know if I can motion. Do I hear a motion? Yeah. <laughs> Do I hear a motion too? Um, I, I will motion. I just have one, one question though. So going forward as requests come forward and I don't know how often they would be, um, they'll be added. You'll keep this spreadsheet going, I'm guessing, and they'll just be added to this. I, that's probably, I hadn't thought about that, Tara, but that's probably the easiest thing to do. And then I had offered to the teachers that if they were comfortable with and the school committee had no objections, they can certainly come before you. But I offered just as I'd done for all of these folks, if it was easier for me to present it, I would be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, I think the log is really useful for us to keep track of what's there. It's just so it makes sense since you've already started this wonderful mm -hmm. spreadsheet. To, to just keep it going as things get added. And I do, I, I motion to approve the- I second it. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry Aye. to cut you off, Tara. That's okay. <laughs> Terrific, thank you very much team. And um, Annie, thank you for uh, uh, helping keep track of what flags and banners are in our schools. Okay, hey, item E, vaccine and pool testing requirements, extracurricular activities, Annie. So I am not recommending this, or I was just putting in that you guys have proved it. I just added that. I'll add that on that flag thing, that below all the flags, the meeting that you approved them on. And I am, I, I was just, the, I was asked this question about whether or not um, the school committee wanted to consider it. And the reason that I say that I should say it this way, that I don't know that it's necessary. So I'm going to give you just some overall statistics from athletics and in general. Um, so in general, you folks know from the weekly dashboard, but I'm going to look at it quickly so that in general at Hopkins Academy, 82% of seventh through 12th graders are fully vaccinated. Uh, as of today, what we have at the elementary school, this was very quick in uh, K through six, we're up to 36% of students at the elementary school are fully vaccinated. That happened in pretty short order. Uh, in athletics, so I have Hopkins Academy athletics, I have co-op. So a co-op would be a Hopkins athlete that's playing on a co-op team for another district and then total all programs, athletics and co-op. Um, so among Hopkins Academy winter athletes, 86% are fully vaccinated, co-op 94%, total all programs, programs 88% uh, are fully vaccinated. So I, I feel as though, and ultimately this is, a, this is a decision from the school committee, but, um, and I wanna be clear, I am very, 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 very pro vaccines. Personally, my own life, I'm very pro vaccines. I also, the reason one I've indicated that our numbers demonstrate that the vast majority of our students and families who are eligible have elected to be fully vaccinated. And that's great news. And um, my hesitancy personally is that if it's, if it's something the Department of Public Health believes that all children should do to participate in school programs, whether that's academic programs or extracurricular programs, um, I would like the Department of Public Health to then add it to their list of required vaccines. So that's just uh, my personal thoughts on that. Thank you for bringing it to us. Um, my instincts are that we shouldn't single out any one category or subcategory 
of student population to make it a Mary, you're cutting out again, if you want to turn off your video. Yeah, sorry about that. I thought, I, I thought the, the edict in the family chat to, for everyone to stop streaming in the household would do it, but apparently not. Sorry. Um, what I was beginning to say was, it, it doesn't seem fair to me to single out any one subset of the population, be it athletes or after school participants or you know, students who might be volunteering and say, you subset must adhere to some higher uh, standard. If, if we're gonna go the route of mandating something, it would have to be universal. And I'm just not sure that I think we already we decided not to go that route. So my instincts are that we wouldn't penalize um, for Annie. Yeah. Is this I, while while yep. we wait for Mary to come back? Yep. Can I maybe I missed this, but this was just uh, was this a request from the community? Where did this request come from, or where did this originate? Uh, just from a member of the community had asked me the question, had not okay. just simply asked the question. And there are, although not, um, I wouldn't say the majority of districts, I don't have an exact count for you, but from our weekly superintendent meetings of regional superintendents, I do not believe that the majority has a requirement. Some districts do. And a member of the community had asked me. And, um, and that's when I, collected all of the data on, on athletes. I started there. I didn't, I didn't include, uh, Humara makes an excellent point of, and this was a athletics and extracurriculars. I don't think if we, if we, if it were, if it were something the school committee wanted to do as a requirement for extracurricular participation, there's a lot of, there's art club, there's everything. Right. Um, but I just ran the numbers on athletics, especially because winter athletics are a little more close contact than perhaps um, and I was pleasantly surprised, although I shouldn't have been based on how high our vaccine rates are across the district. Okay. So in other yeah. words, oh, uh, COVID tests aren't necessarily mapping to athletics. Is that what you're saying? That you're not, you're not seeing any greater number of incidences in the students that are athletes, are you? No, what we've seen in now, and this could change, uh, this could change in January with uh, as Omicron becomes more prevalent, but right now, even in looking at the dashboard, so up to last, well, yeah, this last week, um, we were up to one breakthrough infection at HES um, and 14 infections among unvaccinated people. Again, I really appreciate people sharing information, we don't share identities, but it helps us to look at, well, you know, what, what's working and what isn't in terms of protective measures or mitigation strategies. At Hopkins Academy today, we've had one case and it was a, uh, an infection in an unvaccinated person. So Humera, there really is, it's, there's no activity. If anything, we're seeing very, very low rates at Hopkins. And I would imagine that's because the high rate of vaccination, when you put, staff and students together at Hopkins, you're at 84% vaccine, fully, vac fully vaccinated. That's so I, we're not saying anything in athletics that would lead us to believe that there's, I mean, that there's a greater risk and that kids have been practicing. And now we're up to over 50% of adults and students pool testing every week. That's really great news. And, and while, great. while we're on that topic, I just want to urge anyone listening who hasn't gotten their booster, who is eligible, to please go get your booster. Um, I think that especially with this uh, m much more infectious variety that is um, increasing in prevalence, um, it's just, it's working. Having vaccinated communities, it's working open. It's allowing us as a community to stay safe. So please, when you can, if you can, go ahead and get your third shot. Um, and a reminder for families, yeah. if I could, in case it's a quick reminder for people who are fully vaccinated, 
at this point, fully vaccinated means two doses. You don't need to have a booster to be fully vaccinated, although I, I do uh, echo your suggestion, Humara. But if folks are fully vac- vaccinated, even if a fully vaccinated person is a close contact, they do, as long as they do not show symptoms, um, they do not need to quarantine and they do not need to participate in daily test and stay. And um, sometimes that's a bit, uh, better off for students. Great. So I, I appreciate the information and I'm encouraged by it. I I agree. I, I don't think it's really our position to mandate anything um, outside of what a Department of Health would be. Um, you know, suggesting or requiring. I think making sure, though, that pool testing is available to these folks, given, um, you know, I know they may not choose to participate in terms of at the beginning of the school day. Um, If there's something that's available at the beginning of a practice, if that makes it more accessible, great, you know, then that's an option. But otherwise, you know, I... I think that this is good information to have. I'm really encouraged by the 84% full vaccination staff and students. So thank you. And Annie, I, I just wanted to ask, and I, I think this is true that if for Massachusetts in our, what's the mask requirement for sports indoors? Oh, goodness. Goodness, goodness. I believe that players still need to be masked. Um, and I can make sure that I have that back, that answer back for the school committee on January. So I thought you were going to ask the other mask mandate. I, so I am pretty yeah. sure that that athletes are still uh, masked um, indoors. I believe that's the MIA position. Some of the masks right. have changed. And of course, schools still are until January 15th. And I anticipate when we get back from December break, that you'll see an extension of that mask mandate from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And we still follow the Town Board of Health as well as an added measure. So we follow mm-hmm. their recommendations. And so I agree with Heather um, as well that we shouldn't be um, implementing something more strict that hasn't been a recommendation thus far through the whole COVID process. We've really followed state guidance and DESE guidance. And um, I, 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 I think that it's so far done as well. Um, to continue following their guidance and then the added measure that we do have um, a mask mandate in town still um, and through DESE at the moment. I think that that's a little bit extra reassurance. Um, I think that, you know, pool testing is available through the the school um, and so still encouraging as many families as possible to have their child do pool testing is absolutely wonderful. Um, It's really quick, it's really easy, and it's really painless. And it provides a little bit of extra um, uh, reassurance for families, um, especially as this new variant starts to kind of roar in to the states here. Um, So all of that. Um, And then um, not advocating right now, um, because I know fully vaccinated is still just two, two shots. I do agree with you, Mara, that, you know, encourage anybody that is eligible for a booster, but it may come at a point too, that that might be something that we would want to consider tracking. And if families, you know, are willing to submit um, documentation of their boosters, that would be helpful as well. Um, and it may get to the point where, you know, it'd be helpful to track booster numbers as well. Before we move off this um, topic, I just want to mention in the spirit of testing uh, that while testing has been free and readily available at UMass, and and I've actually utilized those services, they're pretty easy to get that done and expedient. 24 hours later, you have a a test result, um, and I've used that um, for for travel and and just certifying that, of course, I'm in good health. The Senior Center, Council on Aging, is hosting test-free testing um, all week long. And um, so I'll, I, I, it's a simple call to the Senior Center and they'll, they're will they even taking people from other towns. Um, and so if you want the peace of mind um, and want it to be free, um, just call the Senior Center and set yourself up an appointment and, um, and that's free and easy to do this week. Great, that is... Um, you're welcome. 
Um, so if we're um, okay with this topic, and, and I think that's, um, we, we don't have the, the will at this moment as a body to make any specific um, requirements for vaccine or pool testing for any population, but thank you for the suggestions um, and keep them coming and we will keep um, reevaluating as, uh, as things progress with this pandemic. Okay. Moving on to um, item F, fiscal year 23 budget update, Annie. Yes, our last item for me, but I just, uh, final big, big, I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you to the families for providing us the information about vaccination as, um, as a little out of control as all my dashboards can get. It is so helpful when I talk to other superintendents and they say, how do you even know? How do you even know the percentage of kids? I said, I know the number by grade. And it's just so helpful to be able to see where, where we then see um, COVID appearing, right? And, and we can say that the vaccines are definitely working at Hopkins Academy. Um, so the update on the budget, um, we sent to the town for the request of the town administrator on December 15th just what we estimate our fiscal year 23 request of local contribution will be. And at this point in time, we're estimating an increase to local contribution of roughly 3%, about uh, 2.99, so 3%. That's to local contribution. That doesn't mean an increase in the entire overall budget of 3%, but to local contribution. I did make it clear to the town that we are still in the land of unknowns. So right now, or as of last week, Chris and I went on the website from our energy vendor and had we locked in last week, we would have seen locked in for our rates on energy, on fuel oil, on heating oil. Um, we would have seen an increase of, of roughly 28% from fiscal year 22. And we're at, not at the point right now where we're locking in for fiscal year 23, but we just don't know. Based on that, we had to estimate fairly sizable increases in energy costs for fiscal year 23. Of course, at this stage in the game, we're nowhere near finalizing vocational tuitions or special education tuitions for next school year. We can estimate, but we aren't near final numbers there. We are entering into contract negotiations with all bargaining units. And um, it is hard to know at this point in time what the expectations will be and what the support will be for surveillance testing, what we call pool testing, for surveillance testing next school year. Um, so, with that in mind, our estimate right now, as I said, is roughly a 3% increase to local contribution. We did remind the town that uh, last year we did present a zero increase to local between FY21 and FY22. We knew how uh, the town had been hit very hard uh, by COVID. So we were grateful that we could assist and we were also able to return some money to the town last year in addition to presenting a zero increase um, because of the amount of state and federal aid um, for, as a result of COVID. Um, so that's where we are right now. And we're at the very beginning, but just wanted folks to be aware of where we're at. Thank you, Annie. Annie, I was wondering, I know we'll do the business manager reports next month, but if there's any, um, I was just curious about kind of the, the grant landscape as to whether there's any leads or ideas that um, are in the works or things that you've heard might be coming down the pike that may help on this front in terms of just offsetting some of the expenses that we have or for programs. Most of the grants, we did just get another one to so get a grant update um, for another pathway at Hopkins Academy. Um, so on the grant front, I mean, most grants, except for COVID, the COVID funding didn't force us to stick to the supplement, not supplant rules. So normally with grants, you're supposed to be expanding programs, supplementing programs, and not using grant funding to supplant funds that you had already put in the operating budget. Sometimes folks think you get a grant and isn't that great? So reduce the request on the town side 
Now with CARES, one of the reasons CARES is the kind of funding that we got from the feds in the state last year, with that funding, we were able to do that. And because the rules were so flexible, that's what put us in a position to then return some money to the town, which again, we were happy to be helpful because it was a very hard year for the town. Going forward, Heather, I haven't I haven't seen any indication that we're going to continue to see the kind of infusion of funds that we saw in fiscal year 22. I'm not sure um, the bill that right now isn't doesn't seem to be getting where where um, the legislators trying to get it. Uh, that may have had some money in it, but that that still is something that we're we're not sure where that's going to land. So it feels like we're going back to supplement, which is great. We've uh, to date, I've I've written in competitive grants. These aren't entitlement grants. I think to date this year, I've written uh, about two hundred and five thousand dollars worth of grant proposals. From what we've heard back, I think we've received about eighty seven thousand dollars for this fiscal year. But again, the focus is on supplementing. So when something like energy, if that goes up twenty eight percent, which universe willing that doesn't happen. But if that goes up 28%, I, the, the grants that I'm writing to expand programs for, you know, career pathways programs, I can't say, you know, I'd like to use some of that money to pay for our fuel oil. That's where it gets Right. Tricky. Or like special ed tuition or vocational tuition. Precisely. Like, yeah. yeah. Precisely. Understood. Yeah. yeah. I was just curious about, um, since we had heard so much about CARES and how that supported mm-hmm. whether or not and what your outlook was looking ahead to grant opportunities. I don't know. And I definitely don't know right now with um, right, what's going on with uh, the bill that's currently trying to make its way from Congress to the Senate. I, I, I can't, my, I got whiplash, Heather, <laughs> so I have no idea what's going to happen. Like a tennis match. Point. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Heather, for bringing that up. Very important point. Um, And thanks, Annie, for giving us um, a lay of the land about that budget update. We look forward to um, things progressing with more detail that we can review on the budget in future um, meetings. Appreciate it. Okay, so we're skipping the business manager reports. That'll be presented in January. And we're moving on to school committee reports and discussion, (laughs) item A, finance. Ethan. No updates to report this month uh, from the finance committee. Okay, thank you. Um, And item uh, B, policy, Tara. Um, So we are going to be working on um, name change gender identity policy. Um, It's in very, very preliminary stages, something that will be very carefully and thoughtfully um, be brought forward. So there will be more to report in the future, um, but nothing really to report at this point in time. Okay, thank you. And item C, CES, Clash. Yeah, if I could defer that to next month, I was unable to attend the strategic planning session, but I'm happy to report that hopefully, Humera, you'll be getting a collaborative hoodie uh, from them or who, whatever sweatshirt that they're they're getting all of their folks for appreciation. Um, yes, so it, you know I think that they they're really proud of all of the work that they're doing. But I do I, I will have information from their latest update as well as the outcomes of the strategic planning for next month. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, and then last but not least, uh, D Fields and Capital. Paul is not here. He'll provide an update in January. Um, Annie, I, I don't. I imagine that you have nothing to shed. To, n- no light to shed on that. No, I'm lightless right now. <laughs> all right, great. Thank you. Um, all right. So moving on to item seven, announcements. Um, any announcements uh, for any from any of my colleagues at this juncture? I see no's. I have two announcements. Um, The first is um, I was invited by the Council on Aging to attend a session um, that they were facilitating on age, uh, making Hadley an age and dementia friendly Hadley. And this was um, something that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, which some of you may know is a really um, great organization that works with many communities to think about our, our region's long-term strategy 
um, has been working with several communities throughout Western Central uh, Massachusetts to um, help create places uh, that support uh, our growing aging population. As you know, in Hadley, we have a very, very sizable uh, uh, population of elderly folks. Um, and the only thing I want to report, aside from the fact that I'm just really pleased to see this le level of uh, planning and effort is that um, the Council on Aging and the Senior Center and the Friends of the Senior Center remain very interested in collaborating with the schools and with other town departments. They were very um, pleased with our budding um, uh, new relationship on the World Fair, which we held back in August thanks to a special small grant received by the Baker administration on uh, uh, towards the, uh, the end of the summer. And it was a, a way to bring together the community and, um, and um, the elderly sort of like an intergenerational collaborative event uh, at the new C senior center. And so they're really looking for more opportunities like that. And um, we, we talked about past things like young people who have um, uh, from from the elementary school who have gone and um, spent time with seniors and other such things. So I just want to bring that up in the spirit of thinking back to other things we've done in the past. Now that COVID is sort of a little bit more at bay, what might we do in the future? Um, it's, it's definitely something that's important and is helpful to our young people to, um, to be connected to um, seniors in the town. So I'll just bring that up and, and make sure that we're all thinking about that as we move forward and planning for other school related things. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention is that Hadley Learns um, is skipping its December programming, but coming back to, um, to everyone again in January with a, um, climate justice related theme. And if you go to HadleyLearns.com and, and go to the events section, you'll see that there's a, a related book. Uh, you can either read the book or just listen to the podcast or read the articles and join us on the first, uh, sorry, the second Thursday of the month. Um, and that is all I have to report there. And, and Annie, if there's a way that we could have that published in a superintendent's report, uh, newsletter rather, um, that would be great to get the word out about that event. Happy to, happy to. Great, so if there are no other announcements, I think um, we are on to item eight, action items and approval of the minutes for November 22nd. Do I hear a motion to uh, approve those minutes? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor. Aye. Aye. I will abstain. I was not there. Okay. And just a, as a, a point of reminder, you don't necessarily have to be there in order to um, approve or, or, um, or not approve, but, um, but thank you for that anyways. Um, okay. Approval of AP warrants for November, 2021. I believe this is the one that, um, Paul abstain. Um, right, so the rest of us can vote. Do I hear a motion for that? So moved. And okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so that's the one that um, Heather abstains from. Right. So this next one, okay, approval of warrants for November 2021. Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve the warrants for November 2021. Great. Here a second. Okay, Tara gave a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, and we already approved the field trip to Washington, D.C., and so we are all set there. Item nine, next meeting dates, January 24th is our next meeting, and um, I, do, I don't see anyone objecting to that. I think we ought to be able to make that work. Um, so January 24th, five o'clock for the policy meeting and 5.30 for the regular school committee meeting. Do I hear a motion to um, adjourn this meeting? Motion to adjourn the meeting. All right, and do I hear a second? Second. Oh, excellent, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Terrific. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, guys. And happy holidays.